two years ago at this conference. Uh, it was online because of COVID, and I had the uh, pleasure of introducing uh, Professor Yates again. And he made some really funny jokes in the course of his presentation that, unfortunately, no one had the chance to laugh at, although I'm sure they were behind their computer screens. But it's nice to see everyone here in person this year. So hopefully, maybe if uh, not to put too much pressure on you. But uh, and yeah, without further ado, Professor Yates. Thanks. I'm trying to get my uh, screen to get away from the presentation mode. There we go. Okay. And all right. So thanks, thanks, Nikolai. I'm sorry I can't be there. Um, I, I wasn't originally going to be there, but turned actually turned out to be better because uh, I had a double digit close contact maskless exposures at ASMS, and so I was quarantining until Wednesday anyway. Um, but I also have the HPLC conference next week, and I'm as I'm chairing the uh, executive committee, I have to get ready for that. Uh, all right, so um, short title is Patch Clamp Single Cell Proteomics. Um, so single cell analysis in, in neurons has been around for, for a while. So John Sweedler and I started our careers about the same time, and Sweedler started working on uh, single cell analysis techniques and neurons. And of course he was using big neurons from aplasia, but nevertheless, he was uh, still working on uh, single cell, single cell techniques. And uh, so, uh, and he used a var variety of techniques, MALDI, CE, mass spec. And he was pretty, pretty non-denominational in terms of the technologies that he was using. And he also measured a variety of molecules. Although mostly what he did is uh, he looked at neurotransmitters and neuropeptides. Uh, he didn't didn't pay much that much attention to the uh, proteome at that that time. And I think uh, what's important is that Sweeler established the importance of single neuron analysis. And then, of course, uh, you heard, already heard from from Peter. Peter uh, was a postdoc or a grad student, I think, in um, in Sweet, the Sweeler lab. And what I want to show is that um, uh, Peter's also working on on these patch clamp proteomic techniques. And what's a little bit different from what we're trying to do, and I just wanted to um, illustrate it here, is that Peter is sampling from the soma, whereas we're trying to capture the entire um, uh, the entire neuron for, for analysis. And so that's a real a distinction. And there are pluses and minuses to both approach, and I'll talk about the minuses of our approach um, relative to what, what we've, been, we've been doing with this. So I just want to start, I've talked about this before, so I just want to start out a little bit with uh, uh, just analyzing neurons out of culture. And I would also uh, qualify this by saying that neurons are uh, big cells. And so they're probably less of a challenge than what a lot of you are, are trying to do. Um, but they do have other particular kinds of kinds of issues. They have these long cellular projections that go out and they connect to other neurons. And this is the this uh, um, synaptic region is often the uh, the real business end of the of the neuron, and we'd like to be able to analyze that. So that offers up a, a nice little challenge. So this was a, a Alzheimer's study in Alzheimer's disease. Um, there are lots of theories about why plaques and tau tangles and so forth cause loss of memory, but uh, no real solid evidence for, for why that occurs. You can have people that have uh, dementia and you look through an autopsy, you find that they don't have very many plaques. And the people who are sharp as a tack and they die and they you look at their brains and they're a mess. Uh, so lots of different, um, con, con, a lot of confusing data in, in the field. But I uh, bumped into uh, Stuart Lipton, who's a colleague at, at Scripps via email. And we started talking about uh, single cell analysis. And he's been looking at this, this uh, hypothesis of, of uh, neural hyperactivation. And so what he does is he uh, uh, makes... Uh, neurons from a uh, healthy 18-year-old male and puts in a single mutation into presynolin one which is one of the familial Alzheimer's disease genes. And then using technologies that have won Nobel Prizes from uh, the Yamanaka factors to CRISPR-Cas9, and then some differentiation factors, he creates, creates neurons. And then I does he what he was doing was patch clamping on on these things to get out the information about the cellular phys physiology of the neurons. And I suggested uh, when we connected via email that um, maybe we should 
start doing some proteomics on this because single cell proteomics was, was starting to uh, emerge as a real uh, capability. And so just to show you the, the differences between these, these neurons with just one mutation, and you go from being this wild type neuron with uh, spontaneous activation at uh, sort of a normal level, and then in the AD um, neuron, you get this hyperactivation. And the theory among this in this uh, hyperactivation hypothesis is that the neurons are uh, firing, 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 and eventually they just wear out and die. Uh, so that's one of the theories that people are pursuing for, for this. And a lot of that, so some, some of the aspects of the hypothesis is that the A-beta plaques uh, caused this to happen. So what they did is they, they would do uh, their patch clamping, take about 10 to 20 minutes per, per patch clamping. So if you think proteomics takes a lot of, uh, of patience and, and art and all that, uh, this patch clamping stuff is, is even tougher. You know, they don't think you're allowed to drink coffee when you're doing patch clamping or something, something like that. And so we uh, uh, would just put, apply a little negative pressure after the patch clamping, pull the neuron out of the cell culture, uh, stick it into a, into a test tube, um, and then uh, treat it with trypsin 60, 60 degrees for about an hour, and then put it in the mass spec, and it actually worked. Uh, worked pretty well. So the data I'm going to show you is for about uh, 40 odd cells that we've that we've done. We haven't been working that much lately with with uh, Lipton. He's had uh, some staffing problems. Uh, the staff keep getting uh, offered triple the salary to go to industry, and they keep going. I don't know why. Uh, so this, this is roughly the data that we've been getting. So uh, we're seeing we had about a 70% sex success rate on this. We're seeing about 700 or so proteins, and it really ranges from. Uh, you know, a few hundred proteins to almost a thousand, two thousand proteins, and a lot of that thing has to do with reproducibility of recovery of the of the neurons. Uh, but we are seeing some differences between the AD neurons and the wild type neurons. And this right here is uh, a requirement of having a protein be identified, a minimum of three samples per per genotype. But if you just look at the uh, terms of one. Um, we see the, we, we uh, see an overlap of about a thousand proteins and about 186 that are unique to the AD uh, phenotype. And then if you do a comparison among all the, the 40 odd cells that we that we looked at, and when you do PCA, you can see that they, the AD um, cells cluster together and the wild type cells cluster together pretty much. And so we, we're seeing some things which are which are interesting, um, but we still have to have a lot more work to do. And uh, Stuart's got to get his uh, staff back up and, and running in order to do that. Okay, so um, we've also been working with a colleague across the hall who's both neurobiologist as well as a uh, electrophysiologist. And so this has actually been a lot more convenient, except she doesn't work cell with cells and culture. She, she works with uh, live brain slices. And so that's even, even better. And she does addiction research, particularly alcohol addiction research. And what's nice about that is that the, you, can, you can really, really nice, uh, well-documented uh, behavioral phenotypes that, that you can use for this. And, and that uh, makes for really interesting studies. And as you all know, uh, you've probably seen this quote from W.C. Fields, it's easy to quit drinking, I've done it a thousand times. There's also a similar quote from attributed to Mark Twain, it's easy to quit smoking, I've done it a thousand times. I tried to look up the origins of those and those quotes and kind of ambiguous out there who actually said it first and when and where. Um, but just to give you some perspective on this, excessive alcohol use was responsible for more than 140,000 deaths in the United States each year during 2015 to 2019. It's about 380 deaths per year. And just for perspective, uh, COVID deaths 2020 were 385,000. And then pretty consistently in 2021, we had about 386,000, so, which is kind of interesting, I think. I mean, given that um, uh, vaccines were in pretty widespread use by that point. And other perspective, opioid overdose deaths are about 60, 70,000. That seems to be increasing as fentanyl becomes more common. And again, uh, driving around in our cars, we have about uh, 35,000 or so um, deaths per year. And I think with gunshots, it's uh, roughly the same order of magnitude as with car accidents and, and so forth. So some of the questions in the field are what molecules and pathways play roles in addiction and relapse. Addiction reshapes biochemical processes to drive goal-seeking behavior, uh, called chasing the dragon. You try to catch that high that you got the first time you uh, used the substance. 
And as the biochemistry interplays with behavior, it's of course uh, very complicated. So 40 years ago, people used to think that this was just, addiction was just a behavioral thing. And you still hear elements of that among politicians that, you know, uh, pull yourself up and, you know, change your behavior and so forth. And it needs to attribute it to things like hedonism. And now people begin to understand that addiction is really a biochemical process that's been, that's the, the, the drug seeking behavior changes the way your brain behaves. If you've ever had an addiction, I, I smoked when I was much younger and uh, it, it's, uh, it's hard to quit. So we've been, uh, the, the rat mob, the models that people use are rats. And that, um, because rats will self-administer alcohol. And it's interesting, we have to use uh, both males and females when we do these studies, because there are, there are very big differences between males and females in terms of their alcohol seeking behavior. And much to my surprise, uh, females are much more aggressive at their alcohol seeking behavior. And uh, I have to keep my uh, alcohol in my office under wraps so that the uh, rats don't get to it. And if you, I've been collecting this since 1998, and you can see this green box back here in the back. That's a 1998 bottle of Dom Perignon, which uh, somebody gave me when I got tenure, and it's been sitting back there ever since. So uh, um, uh, this, this is what I'm going to do when I retire. I guess I'm going to get rid of all this. Uh, and if you're wondering why it's in my office, it's because I have three teenage sons. So I wanted to um, make sure I, I had it for when I retired. So if one of the first things we started doing was the, we used the system that they traditionally use, which is doing one millimeter punches. And this is generally coming out of the uh, central nucleus of the amygdala. We do single pot digestion, put it in the mass spectrometer. These cases, we were using the uh, uh, Evil Step 1 with the Timstock Pro, and then we were also running the, the Pacer search algorithm on it. And this is all being done with Marissa Roberto's and Marissa Roberto's lab. And Larry Rodriguez is the uh, artisan who can um, get the uh, single cells and the punches out of the, out of the brain. And what we're, we usually go is to the central amygdala. The central amygdala is a very important part of the brain. And um, this is implicated in behaviors related to fear, stress, anxiety, and alcohol dependence. It's predominantly GABAergic neurons with both projection into neurons. It's a very peptide-rich part of the brain. And uh, what, what I think one of the things that we've really learned from the optogenetics techniques is that there are actually a very discrete um, circuits within the brain that control very specific kinds of behavior. And so this is why people have been focusing in on this region of the brain and, and trying to look at the uh, circuitry that, that's involved in this. And one of the uh, proteins that's thought to be pretty important with this is corticotropin releasing factor. It's produced locally by uh, CEA central amygdala neurons and released from the hypothalamus and other afferent regions. It's a 41 residue polypeptide. There are different types. So there's the G protein coupled CRF type, so CRF1 and then CRF type two and then CRF binding protein. It's a key system in stress and anxiety related behaviors. And I believe CRF was probably in, discovered at uh, the Salk Institute next door in Wiley Bale's lab. Um, so Larry goes in, he does the whole cell patch clamp for physiology. And this is just to show you a picture of the, the punches that, that he was uh, acquiring and the postsynaptic currents that he was uh, acquiring as well. And then um, again, we repeat the, uh, we take the punches and we put them into the mass spectrometer using that process that I, that I mentioned. And then uh, we've done this for uh, uh, the, all these different groups. So we have male naive, so no alcohol, male dependent, uh, dependent on alcohol, male withdrawn, then female dependent and female withdrawn. This just shows a volcano plot of the female dependent versus female withdrawn. And this is a Venn diagram showing all, all, the, all the differences. And we can clearly see differences between uh, each, each of these different regions. This is uh, just relatively standard DDA analysis, uh, no library searching, no MBR uh, match between runs. So nothing, nothing particularly fancy here in the, in the data analysis. And as we start preparing this for publication, we'll uh, go back and do some more uh, fancier analyses of the, of the data. 
I think with by uh, also incorporating the um, a library search with the DDA data, we can uh, get more uniformity between between each of the analyses. So we also have developed some software, and I won't be a little bit vague on the uh, on how we're doing this. Uh, it's called P. Unfortunately, we it got named P Setsa, so Setsa is also the name for that thermal protein profiling. Uh, which we can look and we can see what cell in our data, what cell types are represented in our in our data. So it's a kind of a pseudo single cell proteomics in a sense. And for out of these punches, what we're seeing is that it's primarily neurons. There's some oligodendrocyte uh, data, cell type data in there as well. And then, uh, but it's mostly just uh, mostly just these two. Um, uh, types of cells that are present in our in our punch data, which is good because it suggests that we're seeing primarily um, uh, neurons when we, when we do that. And so to do the single cell out of the live out of the live tissue, um, we I thought this was going to be a lot harder than it turned out to be. And uh, Larry Larry worked really hard at, at getting this to work. And so he goes in, he makes his. Uh, uh, measurements and then he applies some suction. He retracts it, pulls it out. Actually, looks at it under the microscope um, as he's pulling it out, and then he uh, puts it into a tube, and uh, then we digest and put it into the mass spectrometer. Um, so this is roughly the surge of the range of uh, the number of cells that we've look, been looking at so far, and then the range of the proteins being identified. And this, this really, I think, points to one of, our, one of the challenges that we have in, in doing this is that we really have to improve on our reproducibility. And I think a lot of that has to do with our, our uh, recovery of the neurons as well as our um, um, ability to, to, to process the samples and to get them into the mass spectrometer without, without too many losses. So we've been having this uh, discussion with uh, Larry as to how much of the neuron are we actually pulling out. And Larry was pretty insistent that he was pulling out the entire neuron, but we don't, we actually find that kind of hard to believe that he's able to get that because the, the um, synapses are actually connected to, to the other neurons. And so it can be quite tricky to pull them out completely. When you're doing this. But we are getting uh, pretty good data. So this is um, the proteins that are represented in this Venn diagram. And, and then these numbers here are proteins that they have to, this is all the data that we've collected for the particular cell types. And, but the protein, a protein has to persist, has to be present in at least two cell, two, two of the experiments in order for it to be, to be listed here. Anything that existed just once, we don't, we don't show. So this is female dependent, female naive, female withdrawn. Interestingly, we, we tend to see more proteins in the withdrawal uh, animals than we do in, in, the, in the other animals. And I uh, like, like um, suggest to me that the brain's screaming out, you know, give me more alcohol as it's withdrawing from the, uh, from the process. But I have no, no clue that that's, that's correct. And so we are seeing we are seeing clearly clearly seeing differences in the data that that's present here, and what's what's also interesting is that we are seeing um, the CRF. Oh, if it's obvious here, we're seeing we are seeing the CRF uh, pathway that is that is present. And that's actually one of the things the the uh, addiction people gave us this big list of proteins that they are uh, focused on, and we uh, are actually able to see about 90% of them in the punches, and we are seeing at least CRF in the males. I'm not sure that's obvious here in the females. And again, this is the male data, again, seeing more in the uh, withdrawn animals than we are in the uh, dependent or the naive. Um, it is kind of interesting that that this seems to be going up in the number of proteins that, that we're seeing. So this would be the normal state, and this is the alcohol dependent state and the uh, animals that are being, that are being or in the withdrawal process. Um, so again, seeing differences here, and then let's see if I can find it. here it is, corticotropin releasing factor receptor signaling pathway. So we are seeing that pathway being present in the, uh, it's being down-regulated in the withdrawn animals. Um, but we are, we are seeing things and looking interesting. Okay, so just to sum up with this, we've successfully implemented this patch clamp with uh, mass spec technology on single neurons. It's uh, time consuming and low throughput. The patch clamp screening for neurons prior to selection for MS analysis is essential in obtaining high quality neurons that electrophysi electrophysiologically behave as expected. Um, some of the options that we have that we haven't implemented yet is uh, to um, increase throughput is to implement the Slavov-Bundnik method with uh, TMT. Um, 
And we're, we're certainly thinking about that. So neurons of culture can yield quality MS data. We identify about 700 proteins or so per, per cell. Uh, we can uh, see neurons and live brain slices, that, which can yield quality MS data. The opportunity is to correlate behavior and molecular mechanisms driving, driving the behavior. And this last part, I've, uh, I'm shouting it out by using all caps. So the further work is needed to improve reproducibility and protein recovery and importantly synaptic regions of the proteins. We are seeing membrane proteins, which is a very encouraging because the real business end of neurons is um, membrane proteins and ion channels. So receptors and ion channels are really where the where the uh, uh, rubber meets the road in neurobiology. And so we are seeing those things. And so that's very also very encouraging for us. And so I wanna finish up with just um, something a little bit different here. Um, and so just to troll Ryan Kelly a little bit, uh, we're calling this uh, Pico Pods. Um, what we're doing is using a process of submerged electrospray of cells. It's almost like a um, fax sorting thing. Uh, we can create controlled droplet size. We can generate hundreds of droplets per minute. And what we're doing is we're encasing, okay. we're encasing cells in a um, nano capsule, and just a single cell into one nano capsule. And so this shows um, some just some of the data that that we've been seeing. So cells are isolated in this pod and it appears to survive the process of creating the nano capsule, which you can see here. So this is cells stained with, uh, with DAPI and with uh, fluorescine diacetate. Fluorescine diacetate gets, uh, it's, it doesn't fluoresce as fluorescine diacetate, but in live cells, the diacetate will be, be cleaved and then it will then fluoresce and then it will fluoresce green. So you can see some of the green uh, being present here as well as the DAPI. So these are cells that are, in, that are uh, encased after the resin has been cured under UV. Uh, again, this is another version here, single cell inside yeah, the cured microcapsule. And then, um, hello, I can hear you, Dimitri. Um, this is a cell lysis inside the, the capsule. So the capsule is not the, 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 the um, encapsulation around the, the cell is not a uh, solid uh, resin, but it's uh, porous. And so we can get things in and out. So this is a, an example of showing that we can uh, lyse the cells inside the microcapsule. Uh, the fluorescein was retained after two days, can still contained. And this is a very fast process in the sense that we can we can um, uh, collect thousands and thousands of, of cells and incorporate and, and cluster them inside these, these capsules. And so this white resin here is all the individual uh, capsules that we've um, that, that we've accumulated over, over the course of this uh, doing doing one of these doing one of these experiments. And these are fluorescein labeled peptides that have been not not in a cell, but peptides that have been in, in, incorporated in or uh, encased in one of these nano capsules, and um, um, they're they're so you can see that they're fluorescent. And then by changing the solvent conditions, we're able to get them to 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 loot out loot out of the the um, loot out of the nano capsules, which suggests that we can we can get things in, we can get things out, and then so we can manipulate things once once they're inside these capsules. So the intent is here is to avoid or at least minimize interactions of proteins with surfaces. <clears throat> I think probably the only other way that, that that would minimize it even further would be to do this acoustic levitation uh, technique that, that some people are, are trying to ex uh, exploit to, uh, to for, for sample handling. And the pods can be manipulated to get molecules in and out, the lysed cells, the digest proteins, et cetera. We are still working on how to analyze the contents, but we do have a plan. Um, mass spectrometry might be too slow to take advantage of the potential scale. As you can see down here, we have all these different things. Uh, besides single cell proteomics, the pods and the process of making the pods have a lot of potential uses. You could think about uh, using this as a way to do uh, drug screening, for example, to, to look at that, that things uh, just at the single cell level. So we, this has been done by uh, 
me go back. This has been done by, by Mario Rodriguez Garcia. Mario is a is a uh, very smart uh, grad student working in working in my lab. He's figured out how to do how to do all these all these things <clears throat> um, to, to make this possible. And so we're we're now at the point where we're starting to uh, work out the plan to try to how to try to analyze these things um, to see just to see what, see what we can do with them. And there's people that have worked on the on the, the studies. So a lot of the, all the mass spectrometry work's been done by Jolene. The um, um, nano capsules, pico pods, have been done by Mario. Uh, Salvador helped with some of the data analysis. The, the Roberto lab, Larry Rodriguez has really been the hands uh, behind the uh, the, the uh, patch clamping. And unfortunately, Larry is is getting ready to leave. <clears throat> and um, this is the Lipton lab that has uh, has done some of the initial stuff I talked about with the uh, Alzheimer's disease research, and of course uh, funding for this. And uh, since we first started doing these uh, SCP meetings, I've now got uh, two grants that have money in them for um, for single cell analysis. And I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions you might have. Thanks for the really exciting talk. I'm excited to hear about how the sample probe advances uh, continue as you work on the technology further. Any questions from the live audience to start off? Hi, John. Uh, David Perlman from Merck. Hi, Dave. Hi. Um, so with this single, <clears throat> excuse me, with the single neuron um, uh, protein uh, peptide isolation. Um, your methodology, you're specifically avoiding um, harsh detergents or chiotropes or, or those sorts of things. And yet, um, obviously, that's a notorious, notoriously difficult um, cellular you know, substrate for, for that. Uh, have you tried like the more mass spec compatible detergents to see whether there's a greater rendering of um, membrane resident or transmembrane proteins? We, we have not. So we, we've not tried to optimize this uh, beyond the initial 60 degrees for one hour. Um, I think there's there are a lot more gains that we can we, that can be made by uh, by sitting down and working this out. I have a microscope and a manipulator on order. Um, so as soon as we get that in the lab, we'll be able to uh, start working on um, uh, on methods without uh, um, impacting Marissa's work too much by tying up her patch clamping system. So we'll have we'll have a, basically a patch clamping system minus the electronics. Hi, John. This is Peter Nemes. Congratulations, great work. It's really amazing to see how you're able to pull up the entire neuron for for analysis. So, so that well, I don't know that I don't know that's the entire neuron, but well, at least a good. Why are we certainly arguing that it was? But right. So I was wondering, as you're pulling up the neuron, with it comes a little bit of media, and are you able to also detect neuropeptides that are released into the media or potential proteins? So not for the live brain slices. So the, the big, the concern with the live brain slices has been mostly the oligodendrocytes, which uh, tend to line along the, the neurocytes, the neurons. Uh, we, have, we have not seen much of those. Um, no, we're, we're, I would say we're, we're not seeing them, at least that we know of. Um, so I think the answer is no. And it seems that your data set must be then uh, represented, for, represented for synaptosomal proteins too, which have been classically difficult to detect. Do you actually see enrichment for proteins that are produced at the synapses? Yeah, that was a question that uh, I gave to Jolene yesterday. And, and we the, the analysis that we've been doing does not seem to have a category for synaptic oh. proteins. So we'd need to go through and look at them. Um, by hand, I just haven't done that yet. Uh, so it's, I mean, the fact that we're seeing um, membrane proteins, you know, ion channels and receptors is, is very encouraging. Mm -hmm. um, but I, 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 I'm skeptical that we're actually pulling out the, um, 
the synaptic end of the of the neuron, um, which would be important to be able to see that those proteins. And I think we may we may have to go after them uh, separately. Mm-hmm. That's what I. That's one of the reasons why I, I'm investing in buying uh, um, a microscope and the manipulators, is so that we can start experimenting with uh, with those techniques of trying to isolate things. We'll probably do cells and culture before we do live brain slices. Live brain slices seem to be kind of a order of magnitude greater challenge than um, than neurons and culture. Yeah, very exciting. Thanks a lot, John. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, I have a small one. It seems like for some of the uh, different conditions, I forget whether it was the um, maybe the uh, withdrawing patients, some of the neurons had kind of a larger fraction of, or in general, it seemed to be a larger number of proteins identified. Do you think, is there any known differences in sizes of certain neurons for people who are undergoing, I don't know, different various diseases? And uh, do you attribute this to the some of the larger pool of proteins identified potentially? No, not, not in terms of cell size. So this, this has actually been fairly consistent as we've been going through this. Mm-hmm. You can hear the Top Gun jets going over. Um, <clears throat> so, so this has actually been, this has been interesting because it's been fairly consistent as we've been, as we've been working on um, neurons that, that Larry's been giving us. Uh, that uh, the withdrawn, the animals that are in the withdrawal withdrawal group, consistently show more proteins, and so that suggests that there are uh, pathways being upregulated or downregulated in response to the withdrawal of the of the alcohol, and so it's going to be interesting to see as we start moving forward on this. Be interesting to see um, how, how that pans out. So one of the one of the challenges I think I asked Nikolai this question a while ago, and it's always it's always puzzled me, is uh, we're we're so um, intent on with our regular prote our bulk proteomics on statistics and, and replicates and all that sort of stuff is how how are we going to think about that in terms of single cell analysis these n of one analyses um, in terms of you know, what's consistent because the whole idea behind doing single cell proteomics is to look at the heterogeneity that might exist within different cells and different cell types. Um, and so how do we think about things like statistics? Yeah, great comments. Um, and uh, I think with that, I think that's the, uh, we'll move on to the next speaker.